you want? What do I want? I mean, what can I get? That's not the way it works. So, Dad would like a host out criticizing the administration. You want to tell Ravenhead or Sid? Well, that's not really how it works, Siobhan. Back me, sit tight, count your gold in your castle here, and I'll make you whole. Okay? No, it doesn't work like that. Can we take a walk? Okay, first, spoilers. This episode, Lion in the Meadow, episode 4, is about volatility and unpredictability and also reversals and reappraisals. Nothing seems to hold its form for long. Characters keep changing sides, realigning priorities and revising expectations. Nothing remains static, and what seems clear early on is ultimately opaque. In a word, this episode is about complexity. There are all kinds of negotiations, double dealings, dishonesties, manipulations, ironies, and inconsistencies. Nothing is as it first appears. People were constantly being manipulated, betrayed, forced to reevaluate decisions and move in different directions. When Tom attempts to force Mark Ravenhead, a signature ATM political commentator, to shift his position to align with Logan's wishes against the current administration, Ravenhead refuses to do so, since it would make him appear inconsistent. He argues for his journalistic integrity and independence and the importance of his friendship with the president. Even before this happens, when Tom is still reluctant to ask, Shiv makes a joke about the whole situation. You know, Ravenhead has his own battalions. He, uh, he values his independence. He's a little bitch. Once he gets it, he'll do what my dad wants. What, White Pride FM gonna pay him 30 mil a year? Shiv takes matters into her own hands and skillfully navigates around Ravenhead's people. Just so you know, Mark only discusses editorial with Sid or Logan. That's just been long standing. Oh, so. no, that's fine. It's not editorial. Hey. Hi. It is editorial. Yeah. So. Then Shiv describes to Ravenhead how it will be going forward. In a sense, this conversation is already over. It's just a question of how many times we scream the word fuck at each other before you do what we want. The next time we hear about Ravenhead, the president has called Logan to complain about his unfavorable commentary on ATN. You want to hear what it sounds like when the president loses his temper? Thanks to Shiv, the president is calling Logan, not the other way around. The equation of power has been reversed. Now it is Logan in the driver's seat. If the president cares about his re-election, he will do the things that Logan wants. The point here is that Shiv starts off being contradicted by Logan when she tries to micromanage Frank and Carl. But then things change. You okayed me to go in there and kick some ass, and I barely... I gave you a destination. I can't walk you there, okay? Okay, Dad, but if you give in to Carl, then everyone starts to carve me out. There's a line. Nothing and... is a line. Everything everywhere is always moving, forever. Get used to it. There is an odd rhythm to this episode, sort of like a yin and yang. Shiv is feckless. Shiv is devastatingly effective. Ravenhead is editorially independent. Ravenhead is taking orders from Shiv. Similarly, the tattooed man from New Orleans, Mr. Albuskew, would expose Kendall as entitled and out of touch, so Albuskew is valuable to Logan. But this homeless man's existence yeah, is also potentially up, devastating to Roman, you know, since Roman was part of abusing and tormenting and humiliating him in the first place. That's how he knew of his existence. Tattoo man, as the Roys refer to him, is helpful to Logan, but he's also part of Roman's destruction. The theme continues on. Josh Aronson's daughter is sick and suffering and cannot be left unattended. Josh Aronson's daughter is jumping into a swimming pool seemingly in the pink of health. We see this again with Frank when he calls to see where Kendall's head is at. In the past, Frank was a friend of Kendall's and a sort of an honest broker. Kendall knows Frank well, trusts his opinion, and gets along with him. This episode, the phone call to Kendall looks like a private communication, but then the camera moves around and reveals something else entirely, that Logan is observing the conversation. So it's Frank's an honest broker, Frank's in Logan's pocket. We see this with Kendall in his response to Josh's simple query. It's all good? I don't know, sure, it's all terrible, it's all good, you know, whatever. But yeah, look, it's a fuck pie. Josh is dissatisfied. He invited Kendall and Logan to his island to determine how the company can survive going forward under family leadership. 
He cannot picture it, and Kendall and Logan aren't much help in creating a feeling of unity. But how does that work? After what you've said, how the hell does that work? And I need to know if this is going to be a functional situation. So, can you work together? Uh -huh. Sure, absolutely. Aronson remains leery. He senses how deeply hurt each of them are. Oh, fuck. When is this going to end? I'm here in separate planes. I gotta say, I don't like betting on blood feuds. At first, Kendall is convinced that Josh Aronson will always be in his corner. Well, Josh Aronson is a lock for me. He's always been a lock right back. After lunch on the island, he restates his position. Look, it's in hand. The vote. Josh is a lock. Uh, well, no, actually, he's out. What are you talking about? He's with us. No, he's out. Frank just got off the phone. Apparently, Dad's little freakout gave him the shits. Weak leadership fractured at the top. You let him fucking shrivel? He saw that? And now he has, quote, zero faith in the post-dad leadership. Yet one can sympathize with Kendall, since he saw Josh interacting with Logan and quoting Walt Whitman's poem, O Captain, My Captain. It seems likely that Kendall made the mistake of taking Josh a little too I literally. I just wanted to uh, check in as an investor, but uh, you know, also as a, as a friend. In this episode, there is a huge disconnect between what people say and what they do. At the lunch, Josh argued that he might be better off with the Roy family. Uh, I hear you on the fundamentals. You know? I mean, fuck Sandy and Stewie. After financial engineering them, I can do that myself, right? Yeah, absolutely. But this... By the end of the episode, Kendall witnesses Josh embracing Stewie at the airport. He was the visitor that Josh had mentioned would soon be arriving. Kendall notices details, and it probably meant something to him that Josh came out to greet Stewie, something Josh wouldn't do for either Logan nor his friend, Kendall. Only too late, Kendall discovers what Josh was doing, evaluating Logan and Kendall as the overseers of his investment in the company. He has little use for either of them, and he nearly kills Logan in the course of testing their fealty to one another. Little, if anything here, had to do with friendship. For example, Josh's reaction to being invited to Kendall's 40th. Big fucking nervous breakdown of a party for my 40th. You gotta come. Yeah, who's going? What, you, you need the list? You, me, and Henry Kissinger. Fuck you, I know everybody. It's gonna be the bomb. Oh, cool, cool, yeah, yeah. We should hang more. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Yet another disconnect. The heated conversation in which Logan and Kendall engage as they walk a few yards behind Josh is revealing and fits into the theme of complexity. Logan seems to be in a magnanimous mood earlier, explaining away Kendall's behavior as overzealousness. It'll be okay, because he's a good kid. Okay? Yeah. He did what he thought was best. I think he went too far, but maybe it'll be him one day. It's in his blood. He learned it all from me. And maybe... Maybe he's the best one of all of them. But the conversation on the trail is quite different. The insults they trade with one another, when Josh is seemingly out of earshot, are cruel and devastating and reveal much of their relationship and history together. Uh, you're on your own now, son. And I've got the resin under my thumb, I've got the family, I've got little Greggy, I've got the fucking tattoo man and the tank. You're high and dry. Face it, son. You lost. No son would ever want to hear this from their father. Kendall is also devastating. Uh -huh. Look at you. You're 600 years old and you've pissed off your fucking boyfriend, the president, and he's sending the feds on you and you're wriggling, but you're in too deep. It is hard to know how much is posing and how much is what they actually believe. In this way, it is similar to the positive spin that Logan puts on Kendall's actions. Maybe it wasn't entirely for Josh's benefit. Things are changing fast, being reevaluated on all sides. Sitting down with Greg in the morning part of the episode, Logan is as commanding and powerful as ever, and he gets what he wants from Greg, unanimity in the family with the joint defense agreement. Yet by the afternoon on Josh's island, Logan is exposed as a doddering, sickly, elderly man, perhaps on his last legs, this tells Josh what he needs to know, since he already has little faith in Kendall as it is. Josh doesn't buy that there's any solidarity between the two men, Kendall and Logan. Under the circumstances, 
Josh becomes aware of the benefits of Stewie and Sandy's vision over Kendall and Logan's. What has happened to Logan Roy, he seems to be wondering. Is he only a shadow of his former self? There is an extreme irony here. Josh Aronson has made those in the Roy family aware that they largely stand alone, hence they must pull together to survive. Kendall seems to be thinking this when he sees Josh greeting Stewie on the tarmac. In some ways, Josh Aronson has focused things. Without him, Kendall and Logan were preparing to sleepwalk their way into the shareholders' meeting and probably lose family control of the company forever. Ironically, the only way forward to defeat Josh and Stewie and Sandy may be for Logan and Kendall to work together. They may now have no choice. The last area of interest, where succession went to a place it hadn't previously, yet still fits in with the theme of complexity and subtlety, was to delve ever so slightly into the nature of anti-Semitism. This is always a fraught area and hard to deal with properly. Still, in 2021, some seven decades after the Nazi destruction of European Jewry, it is interesting to see that certain questions are still being asked, perhaps quietly. For example, what is the place of the Jew in society? For most people, this question, sometimes called in Europe and Germany the Jewish question or Judenfrage, is not operative anymore, yet stereotypical beliefs and discriminatory thinking still persist. Is a Jew a person in their own right? Is it just Josh, for example? Or must a Jew be judged differently, in a wider frame, as somehow representing an entire ethnic group? This is where the Aronson part comes into play. Is it investor Josh Aronson? Or is it American Jewish billionaire investor Josh Aronson? Why is Josh's house a castle, while Logan's home is merely a New York co-op apartment? These kinds of distinctions are subtle, but noticeable. Logan's unfortunate stereotype of a Jew, as someone living in a castle, Counting up their gold like a miser and devouring bagels is revealing. It is something we haven't seen him do before this episode. He also goes after Josh's New York roots. Earlier, Carl also makes reference to the Merchant of Venice, with Josh wanting, according to him, his pound of flesh from Logan. Connor mentions to Shiv that in the past, when they could get away with it, Waystar Royko was no exception in eschewing Jews and other minorities from working for their company. Connor also refers to his father as being a racist. Kendall goes even further. Just close the deal with Josh. He fucking hates you too. Your anti-Semitic fucking bagel and gold Yo, bullshit. Oh, fuck off! As Kendall puts it earlier during the conference call, albeit in an entirely different context, accountability is a fucker. Logan doesn't like being called out on his tone deafness to the times in which he is living, but he richly deserved to be. I guess in the context of this episode, it's Jews as undesirable foreigners or Jews as members of society. We know full well where a supremacist like Ravenhead stands on the Jews, but it was odd to hear Connor talking about his father in this manner. And also, why is Ravenhead, an obvious Nazi lover, still employed by ATN? It says something about Logan and Tom and Shiv and Kendall and Roman too, that nothing was done about Ravenhead when Tom investigated him in season two and found him to have spoken to supremacist groups and to have admired Hitler on some level. Uh, And this other one that came up, just to fend this off, have you ever read Mein Kampf? Um, Yeah, a couple times, I guess. A couple times? Are there Easter eggs in there you didn't get the first time? (laughs) Ravenhead is a means to an end, even for Shiv, who uses him to intimidate the president on Logan's behalf. So if he serves a larger purpose and will do her bidding, Shiv is prepared to overlook, well, almost anything. Employing a nefarious man like Ravenhead tells you all you need to know about how Waystar Royko is dealing with controversy generally, trying to bury it and hope that people don't notice. The writers of Succession have most of this exactly right. Oftentimes, large organizations just hope to tamp things down, like a DOJ investigation, and survive and hope that memories are short. The press often gets tired of such stories after a few days and just moves on. Logan is hoping for his family's sake that it goes this way. Perhaps he hopes another large story like 9-11 or COVID-19 will render the scandal irrelevant. Also, it doesn't hurt that he now has the raisin on his side. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, consider subscribing. It's a kind thing to do and will permit me to make other videos for viewers like you. You know they're calling me Terminal Tom down on 7 because I've got cancer of the career.